Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Vertex webinar series on uh, Technopreneur. My name is Ju Ho. Uh, I'm a managing partner at Vertex Venture Service Asia in India. I'm also a host uh, for this first webinar session on introduction to technopreneurship. Now, before we begin, there are some housekeeping uh, matters. First, please note that the session is uh, recorded. And secondly, if you encounter, do encounter problem during the session, please uh, lock out and try logging in again with another device. Now, we are, do have time for Q&A, so please use the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom uh, of the screen and send us the questions. And also, please, uh, there is a survey at the end of the session. Uh, we hope that you can help us complete the survey so that uh, we can uh, do better next time. Okay, uh, with me, let me introduce you to the three panelists, uh, three wonderful friends whom I have known and worked you know, very closely for many years. First is uh, Ben Matthias. Uh, ben is also the managing, direct, uh, managing partner at Vertex Venture Service Asia and in India. Ben has many years of experience in uh, enterprise software space and then another 10 years uh, in venture capital in, in NEA India. Ben joined us about five years ago and currently heads our India office in Bangalore. The second panel member is T. Fua, a serial entrepreneur uh, who actually has uh, successfully founded and exited three startups. And we happen to be investor in one of them. So we're very happy that he gave us you know, some very good returns. Uh, that, which is the latest one uh, called Space Mob, which uh, we were acquired in 2017. And with the, with the acquisition by WeWork, he was then appointed as the Managing Director of WeWork Service Asia and Korea. And in between these three startups, he actually was also a Managing Director of Skype Asia Pacific. He has just left WeWork, taking a break. You know, I understand he's enjoying you know, his time in the family, not thinking about what he wants to do. In fact, uh, maybe later on he's going to share what, what his uh, hobby right now. The third panel member is Joseph, Joseph Hua, uh, who is the chairman and co-founder of uh, M17 Group, which is the leading live streaming company in Taiwan, Japan, and Chinese-speaking population in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, Joseph co-founded uh, Pakto, but always had a bigger dream of uh, building a unicorn. And he was instrumental in merging Pakto with uh, 17 Media, and then later became the CEO of the combined uh, entity. I'm proud to founding Bakhtar. Joseph actually uh, spent some time in investment banking and also as a regional uh, manager in Da Vinci Holdings. Now, before we begin the panel discussion, I actually have prepared some slides which I want to share with, with you, you know, some of my learnings and experience from working with all the many wonderful founders and startups uh, in my VC journey. First, uh, first slide. I think we probably need not delve too much into the definition of an entrepreneur as most of you already want. Uh, what is important is you know, to, to know that uh, for, to start a business, there are two ways of looking at it, uh, going about it. It all depends on the type of lifestyle that the entrepreneur chooses. Uh, one can of course start a business, uh, start as a small business. The typical starting point here is for making profit to sustain the family and lifestyle. There is also no desire in, in such case to scale, and typically it is a single store in a hyper-local setting. Now, the other approach is, of course, one that we are more interested in and we are more familiar with, uh, which is a growth-driven uh, uh, business, or typically what we call a startup, right? Uh, here, the, the starting point is not about making money, uh, although it is an expected uh, outcome uh, in the future. The approach is driven by uh, innovative ideas uh, to solve an unmet uh, pain point or problem. And this type of business uh, usually is set up for scaling, growth, and expansion, including as, uh, internationally. So what is a startup? It is about disruptive uh, innovation uh, to solve a pain point or a problem uh, with a new product uh, to change the world. The risk and failure, of course, are very high but the journey can be very satisfying, more so when it is successful. Right? As I said, you know, the startup journey is arduous. There are so many unknowns, uh, challenges, uh, pitfalls, and half the startups actually close down uh, after the fourth year, 
and only about one third survive beyond the seven year. And typically, the top ranking failure reasons uh, include, you know, no market need, run out of cash, and losing out the competitor. However, you know, actually talking to all the founders, you know, they told me that they actually relish going through this startup journey, uh, despite the outcome. To them, it is personally gratifying, and better still, you know, if it ends up uh, uh, very successful, a really good payday reward for all the efforts and sacrifices. Now, I always wonder why do people want to become an entrepreneur? And, you know, before jumping in, it is always good to ask, to do a self-check and ask yourself uh, what you really want to do with it. What are the motivations, the questions that one should be asking about, you know, uh, like all the sacrifices, you know, in terms of family time, money, uh, physical, emotional stress. And I see T nodding, he said, you know, getting rejected or turned down very frequently, uh, lifestyle choice. And also, are you willing to spend, you know, at least 10 years of your time, of your life doing this? And yet knowing that you may still fail despite all the hard work and sacrifices. Right? Uh, and also, you know, quitting your job to leave on the brink of bankruptcy isn't really all that fun. Right? However, very important thing, of course, is to have the full support of your family. Uh, you are not the only one uh, sacrifice to, who is uh, sacrificing. They too actually make significant sacrifices. However, you know, sometimes you just need to take the chance on yourself uh, and the time is always, you know, now. Ask yourself, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? You know, so I have a slide here to talk about a 2% mindset. You know, uh, typically we find that founders are, are more likely to be on the 2% mindset here. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So, okay, sorry, I missed. Okay, fine. That's fine. Uh, the first step after deciding to take the plunge is to frame the idea and make the plan. This is about asking questions of what you're trying to solve. Uh, is it a disruptive or does it provide only marginal benefit? And why would people want to use this product? Uh, how big is the real market? You know, in fact, one of the real tests is, you know, is it whether it's big enough is uh, whether you can attract a smart and serious VC. <laughs> in addition, you have to know how to build this product, operationalize the business, how to sell, and how much money is needed, at least, you know, when you start at the beginning phase. Uh, the next one is very important and which is a question I'll pose later on to all the panelists. You know, to me, I think you may also want to look for a co-founder or co-founders. Right? For Vertex, we prefer more than one founder, uh, unless you're somebody you know, uh, like T, a serial entrepreneur who has done it before and can bring with him a team uh, from the start. The next slide is actually a cheeky slide. You know, uh, you know, I put together with my colleague a slide, what I call the dream journey of a startup. Now, I call it a dream journey because this journey goes all the way to an IPO. Uh, certainly a very big dream for all startups. However, you know, in reality, only a very, very tiny, small percent of startups will actually reach uh, the end of this IPO, IPO goal. Right? The next few slides, I actually want to share my experience and learnings from from all the founders. Uh, I like to start with positive things first. So let's talk about uh, what makes uh, great founders. Uh, I have identified uh, several uh, attributes and what I show is of course it's not exhaustive. First, entrepreneurs are not born. They learn from doing and get better. And they have clear vision, uh, can sell vision to all the stakeholders, which is very important, and partners, including investors, uh, customers, bankers, and employees. They are willing to be different, uh, which is a very, very important thing, and play differently in order to win, because you know, they, are, they don't follow the masses, you know, they think quite differently. They are street smart and resilient, and very importantly, very open-minded about learning from others. Take advice and you know, are able to internalize their decision for all the inputs. And, and also contrary to, to, to general belief, right? You know, great founders do not love risk. They do intelligent and informed risk taking so that they can take advantage of opportunities when they arise. And lastly, you know, great founders are very disciplined because they know they have nobody else to fall back on. Uh, and with limited resources, 
uh, they have no choice but to to ensure that they are very prudent on you know and or disciplined on on the this resources that they have. Now, I also want to share some several slides uh, following this, you know, uh, on things that uh, founders miss. You know, um, of course, not all things are so positive. Not all things and processes are perfect. Here, I like to share some ideas, some areas that founders miss and all did not do well. I will only focus on some topics. Um, there are separate individual topics like uh, raising capital, scaling and expansion, building great companies uh, that my other colleagues will cover in later sessions in this webinar series. First of all, in the ideation stage, uh, many times I find founders not doing enough research uh, or feedback uh, to ascertain the real market. Many times I also find that uh, founders do not go deep, deep enough to understand the market nuances and who the real users are. This ends up, uh, you know, giving themselves a misguided sense that the market is actually larger than it is. Second point is about find, uh, founder bias. This is about founder loving their product so much and then believing that everyone else is just like them without really finding out if and how many people really feel the same about the product. The third thing is about you know, uh, assuming that the ecosystem is already there to support the use of the product. And this results in product being ahead of its time. Uh, many times we see that as you know, the infrastructure is not ready to support the use of the product. <clears throat> and this is also related to point four uh, on the, the difficulty of uh, trying to change user behavior. <clears throat> and trend traffic takes a long time, of course, you know, to change. Just look at how long it took e-commerce to reach, you know, a, a couple of percent after more than 10 over years. And even now in the US itself, it only accounts for about 12% uh, of the total retail. Now, the, the, the other next point is about, you know, you also want to ensure that uh, uh, a business model that you come up with can scale easily with little additional resources. A uh, business model that where, where a lot of the additional resources are increased proportionally with growth is very hard to fund. And then don't, Darcy, don't put off smart investors by trying to, to impress them with hyper growth projection from the start. And we have seen this quite a number of times, you know, uh, some startups come in showing Second, third year, they grow to 200 million uh, revenue, you know, and fourth to fifth year, 500 million revenue, you know. I, I, I just wonder, you know, are they trying to impress us or are they very sloppy? Uh, and also show to us, to me, actually, you know, the lack of maturity in the top process. The next point I want to talk about is uh, putting the team together or forming the team. Uh, I noticed uh, in not many, many cases, you know, uh, first mistake is about having too many co-founders. After dividing the equity, uh, each co-founder ends up with a very small stake, you know, which ends up being not many, very motivating for all the hard work. So be realistic, why do you need so many co-founders? Right? They may be your buddies, uh, but you're building a company, you know, sorry, no, not having a party. And you should be bringing in skills, experience that complement the area that you lack. Uh, and also, you know, ask yourself um, whether they share the same mindset and vision as you. And remember, you want to bring in the strongest and the team, strongest team uh, to execute and outrun your competitors. And not doing just because they are your buddies whom you, you like to hang out with. The second big mistake uh, is having equal shareholding uh, for all co-founders. Uh, always remember that CEO co-founders must always have higher uh, equity stake. For Vertex, we take this very seriously. Uh, the CEO founder takes on much bigger responsibility and should be compensated and motivated as such. The next few points about co-founder conflicts, co-founders co conflicts. Um, I must say that fortunately, I do not encounter many of such situations. But on those occasions that uh, when it actually occurs, um, I find that uh, it is always due to founders not being close enough to openly discuss and agree or disagree, you know. Uh, it is open, it's just very important to know your co-founders uh, as if they're your own family or your, your close personal friends. Right? However, in any case, uh, it is always a good practice uh, in the beginning uh, to agree to an arrangement with some signed legal document. Huh? Very important, always must have some signed legal document. Should there be a fallout in the future? Because you don't want to end up having to deal with this without a legal document and then things become very difficult. 
And lastly, even the limited uh, cash at the beginning, it is always a tricky question of, you know, when do you make the first hire, how do you make the first hire, and how to get things done with little money. All right, next slide uh, is about raising money. Uh, there, there is actually a full session after this session two uh, on this topic, but I just want to cover some points uh, which I think is uh, important. First one is, of course, uh, it's about mistake of giving too much equity in very early, early first, in fact, the first round, pre-seed or angel round. Right? I know of a startup I actually give away 70%, you know, uh, and then it becomes very difficult, even impossible for us to to even look at it because you know then we have to end up either renegotiating uh, which is too painful for us right so typically a, a dilution if you look at this uh, survey typically the dilution of pre seed and age around is about 10 to 50 percent because the money that they raise is small you know tens of thousands of dollars or maybe the hundred or two hundred thousand dollars and seriously it tends to be higher uh pro usually about 20 25 percent uh, and because the amount they raise is, you know, it's much higher, three to five million. Right? Next, uh, let me jump in. Yeah, having too many small investors, this is always a problem. Uh, we find that it is a, a real hindrance to subsequent financing round. Uh, first of all, it is also not easy to get every one of the individual shareholders to agree to the terms of the new financing round. And also imagine the, the uh, nightmare of trying to get every single in, individual investor to sign on the new agreement. Uh, the third point is about uh, something which we encounter very frequently, uh, founders holding out closing just for lower dilution. Right? What I can say about this is that you know, this delay actually in funding uh, leads to business suffering, uh, loss opportunities and sales. Right? And this is actually the real dilution in creation value to your company uh, because you, you end up uh, delaying the the funding for six months, nine months, a year. You know, I think you have more important things to do and you have bigger uh, fish to fry. Uh, the next point is about uh, not able to articulate upfront at, uh, you know, um, in the fundraising presentation, what the product is and why would people want to use it. You know? um, I find, I see this many times, uh, mostly with the younger founders, you know, the newer founders, spending too much time on passwords, you know, an unclear statement of what the business is actually is and what it's trying to solve. Now, you should go straight to say what the product you're building, what problems you are solving, why the world needs it, and why is it a huge market. Uh, at Vertex, and I'm sure, you know, most of the other VC funds as well, we invest in only about 1% uh, of all the startups, startups that we meet and come across. Now, so we see by us are uh, looking to invest in quality founders and teams that can clearly articulate and execute. The next point is about uh, uh, investors, right? You know, uh, do your when you go fundraising, always remember to do your research to know your who are the investors you are approaching, approaching, right? Find out if they invest in this sector, for example, uh, whether their investment philosophy, uh, will they spend time with, working with you after they invest? And do they even have uh, much money left to support your future financing round? This is very important, right? And some VC I know actually invest in competing companies uh, within the same fund. You know, you surely don't want your info to be shared uh, with your competitors. Don't ever believe in China war, right? You know, this is only on paper and theory. In practice, you know, when, when they come to a crunch, um, you, know, you will see a lot of time this thing being broken. Now, the last point is very interesting because I, I encounter a lot of founders uh, who keep telling me, you know, that, oh, you know, I met this, 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 I met 10, 10 VCs and well, all of them are very interested. Uh, but actually, this means nothing. You know, um, don't, don't get a false sense of, wow, you know, I have so many VCs that are interested. Um, you should really ask yourself, did they follow up earnestly after the first meeting? Uh, what type of info did they ask for? And actually quite important is who is the one from the VC that is, who is talking to you. Uh, remember that even partners are not all equal. Right? Okay, I think I come to the last slide now on other observation before we, we go into the panel discussion. Uh, and a few points here, and one of the products, uh, remember the 10 times law. You know, your products should solve the problem 10 times better than, than any competitor. Next thing is about you now, uh, many times uh, I also encounter 
company startups announcing too early, keep the market waiting for the product. And after a while, you know, uh, uh, people get uh, tired and worse still, you know, competitors release ahead of you. And also I see many times uh, products that are put off users because it is cumbersome to use. So make sure that you have reasonably good uh, UI, UX, you know, a good, very, very good user experience. Um, and also don't put too much bells and whistles in the product. Remember customers only want to know how to solve their problem. Uh, they don't care what kind of that or, or features you, know, you have put into the product. On the marketing and sales, memorize this customer happiness. You know, a customer happiness is very important, uh, so memorize this. Right? And second is about know the user and more importantly, who the buyer is. Uh, they can be two different person, don't forget. You know, sometimes uh, they can be the same person, but sometimes they also can be a two, person, two, two different person. For example, a cybersecurity startup that we looked at, the user is the R&D, but the buyer, the one who decides and who pays money is the CISO, the, the chief investment, uh, chief security officer which is totally two different departments. And this usually ends up creating sales conflict or even lengthen the sales cycle. Now, the next point is about underestimating effort uh, and time to get sales, right? You really have no control if or even when the, uh, the customer will buy. Uh, in many such situations, cash becomes tight and um, uh, many companies fail at this stage. And the, the last point is about, you know, not using scarcity approach. I see many startups don't know how to use scarcity approach to bring in, especially initial sales. This could be as simple as creating exclusive notes of use for a limited time period or limited uh, exclusive use. Now, in the operation side, spending too much, too fast, too soon after fundraising. We, I actually know of a startup that upgraded all their computers to high-end MacBooks immediately after they raised the financing. Well, this is really a terrible use of uh, our money. Uh, premature scaling, uh, this is a real, very real problem. Uh, so almost uh, three quarters of the startups fail because of premature scaling. Uh, as they run out of money uh, or by spending too fast and, and or doing uh, too many things at once. And don't forget, you know, uh, to put your house in, in order. Don't forget about the legal protection, uh, especially the IPs, the patents, the processors, documentation and also having the books up to date so we know the health of the company at your fingertip. I actually know of a situation where the closing of finance was delayed, delayed actually by more than six months because all the records were not in place or were not in order. Now lastly, I just want to make a few points uh, you know, about founder CEO. <clears throat> they should learn to listen more. Um, I must say most founders do this, um, but there are some cases you know, we have encountered founders who, you know, they hear, but they, they don't listen, right? And second point is about networking. And networking is a very important function that many founders neglect. They generally like to socialize within the same group of uh, friends. So, you know, it is important because networking opens up opportunities for business development, sales, potential investors as well. Uh, third point is about uh, making communication. You know, make communication a big part of the job as a founder CEO. Employees and stakeholders look to you for clarity and direction, and especially in uncertain times like what we are facing right now. And lastly, very important, you know, uh, for founders, when you are faced with uncertainty and confusion, remember always go back to why do you start this venture? You know, I think it, it helps to give clarity to, to your whole purpose of why you are doing this. So I've come to the end of my sharing. I uh, hope that uh, what I have shared is useful for you. Next, I would like to jump into a, the panel discussion. I will be, the way that I will do it is I will be asking questions to the panel members and all the questions are really uh, practical issues that they face. And panel, panel members will share their experiences on how they deal with those issues and also you know, give their comment. Please remember to send in your questions through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and, and please indicate if you are directing the question to any specific mem uh, member, panel member. All right, so let me jump straight into, <coughs> into the panel discussion. Uh, and I've divided the, the, the questions into a few topics, right? The first topic is about uh, 
founders' mentality and traits. Now, actually, I would like to direct this question to both T and Joseph. Um, maybe T can go first and Joseph can, can chime in later. So my question is, both of you did not immediately start a company after graduating from universities. Uh, in fact, uh, you worked for a while in corporate world for several years, you know, and both, more interestingly, both of your parents are entrepreneurs who have built you know, successful businesses in their own rights. So my question to you, you know, first of all, is why not join your family business? You know, is the family background a influence on you doing your own startup? And then followed by, you know, um, why do you want to do your startup? And how do you decide what business? So maybe we start with tea. Okay. Well, the time, well, first of all, thanks for having having me. Uh, it's been a while since I did a, a webinar, so I'm really uh, <laughs> glad to be out at the house and do something uh, with you guys. Um, look, I, I'm really grateful uh, to have someone like my dad, uh, who is also a serial entrepreneur himself. Uh, he's built successful businesses. You know, not nothing big or, or, or you know, in, in, in a large scale perspective, but he's definitely one of those guys who took on risk um, and, you know, who basically just willing to try anything um, uh, to really just start building businesses. Um, you know, I am very fortunate and I'm grateful that I, I, at least from, from an early childhood perspective, uh, at least my dad uh, made it clear in terms of the basics of running a, uh, a business, you know, what are the fundamentals. Um, the other thing that I think I learned quite quickly is the, uh, Sort of the people first approach. I think whatever you do, um, whatever industry you're in, your biggest asset is always going to be the people that works with you and for you, right? And I think that is something that I think uh, at least my parents have at least instituted on me uh, from, from the early days on. Um, and I'm always encouraged, right, to do something else on my own. Uh, it, it is never about uh, being forced or asked to join a, a family business, you know, like, well, he's doing well on his own. Um, but and you have never had the intention of joining him? No, I never. We were, we were never forced to, uh, <laughs> to do that. Uh, to be quite honest, I think my dad would be a lot uh, happier and prouder for us to, at least me and my siblings, to go out there and do something on our own, right? Um, and I think for me, it's, it's, uh, it's not only an influence, but it's also a motivation, I guess, right? I think given that uh, your, your first mentor, right, and someone who's been with you since your early days have done this, it, it, it kind of opens up that mindset that this is a possible thing to do. But despite the fact that, you know, a large part of, of, of startups do fail, a minor, small amount that you become successful, um, but it, it, at least in my mindset, it, it's always a, um, it's not a question of, of how or why, it's a question of when, right? It's, it's always a milestone for me to say, okay, this is where I'm gonna start looking at businesses. Um, I think to, to answer your question, yeah, you're right. I think for me, I, I've gone through the path of, of uh, you know, graduating college and then work for a few companies. Um, I, it, it's always a matter of when and when this milestone's gonna hit for me to start that first startup. My, my first startup was actually in Silicon Valley. Um, it, it was actually catalyzed by the fact that I was actually laid off in one of the startups that I worked for. Oh, okay. um, and not many people know that, but now I guess a few hundred people know this. <laughs> um, but but it, it, it was, I was laid off during the dot-com um, uh, you know, uh, days when things just went horribly south, when pets.com eventually didn't work out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but with, with sort of um, distress situations like that, I know it comes with opportunities as well. You know, I was encouraged to look into developing uh, my first startup, which is into the IoT sector, Internet of Things. Back then, there was no YouTube. There's not even a, uh, uh, you know, a, a 3G uh, handset, right? That's not even an iPhone at that point in time. We basically built uh, a technology that connects different devices together over two and a half G network internet, uh, you know, basically syncing up, syncing up Mac, PC, set-top boxes, and other network devices. Uh, we created it in a way, um, a cloud solution, when cloud as the word is not even defined yet. I'm showing my age now, I guess. Um, but, um, but I guess it's, it's just like any startups, most founders, we're trying to solve a hard problem. And back then, for you to do something as simple as uploading music or video content, you need a CS degree at most, right, to sort of figure things out. And we just made it so simple to be able to allow you to share content uh, in your own devices. Uh, and that was sort of the impetus for, for starting my first company back then. Yeah. 
Okay, all right, great. Uh, Joseph, how about uh, maybe, you know, your, your perspective? Well, the team's covered very, very much of uh, what I was going to say. I think uh, I'll just echo, I, I think it's all about the people and you don't, you don't go out there to, I mean, at least, at least for myself in the last, in the last seven years that I've run the company, I've not, it was never about starting a company. It was, it was always about the people around us and, and, the, and the problems they were trying to solve. And, you know, you solve one problem, you move on to the next one and you, you start building, building a group of people around you that solve problems that you guys see. And then, and um, so it's, it's never been about, okay, let's build a business. It was about solving problems, of course, making financial sense along the way. Um, and and uh, I would echo T as well. Um, it's again about the people, and uh, that's what I saw in my parents when they were they were running their business as well. Um, and my mom always said, uh, you know, you, you don't learn how to run a business without knowing how to be a person. You learn how to be a person first before you start running business. In, in Chinese, uh, uh, yes. so it's, 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 it's something that I've, I've held, um, held over the last last seven years, so across everything, right? You, be it treating your investors or your, or your team members or your colleagues or your partners, it's all the same. Okay, great. Uh, maybe I move on to Ben. Uh, ben, you have come across and, you know, work with so many startups uh, in, in your career, right? You know, um, from the perspective of the different types of, of uh, founders, you know, uh, what is like a mix of founders, their experience and and versus fresh out, you know, school perhaps, you know, and which are the one that uh, that you are likely to invest in, and why, you know? Yeah, we, we see all types of founders uh, in when when we talk to people, we see people straight out of school, and we see uh, founders in uh, sometimes in their late fifties as well. Uh, typically, very often for uh, consumer type businesses, uh, we see very young founders because they know what the latest trends are with the millennials. Uh, very often, we also see founders who uh, have done a research project in college and look to uh, uh, look to build a company out of that. Uh, but I think the the main thing here is a strong founding team will recognize the skills that they are missing and look to augment them. And very often, with the advice from investors. So, if you take a couple of uh, good examples, uh, Facebook was started by people who hadn't even graduated, but they brought in Sheryl Sandberg, who brought the adult experience. Same thing with Google, brought in Eric Schmidt. So the uh, good founders will recognize what they're missing and uh, augment those skills. Uh, so that's one of the things we look for uh, in a founding team, regardless of how much experience they bring. Uh, do they have that confidence in what they're doing, but also have the humility to take feedback and recognize what, they're, uh, what they need? So is it important you know, to, to, for founders to have uh, similar prowess, industry experience and knowledge? No, in fact, uh, a, a good combination of, uh, if you look at a, a, a two-member uh, two founding team, one could uh, bring the tech, uh, tech skill set and the other could bring the go-to-market skill set. Now that's a great combination. Where one is more outward facing, uh, it talks to investors, talks to customers, and the other one is more inward facing, uh, manages the factory and house. Uh, um, we've sometimes seen founders with uh, with a big age difference between them. But I think the important thing is the founders need to be able to work very closely together because really it's, it's, um, it's not only a business partnership, it's a friendship. You are really sharing the pain, you're sharing the good times, you're sharing the, the, the bad times, and you're really supporting each other as founders. So regardless of whether you're the same age, whether you're uh, from different cultural backgrounds, you've got to have that very close connect. Hmm. That's interesting. So I think this leads to the next next question that I have about co-founders. Um, maybe let me direct to 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 T first and, and Joseph. Is having co-founders important, and and why? Mm. Um, look, I, I've I've done a few on my own, and then and, and, uh, two of my startups uh, I do have co-founders. I, I think it really depends on the stage of where you are in your life and your sort of experience level and, and you know what you see and, and what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think you called it out in one of your slides where a, a startup path is a very lonely one and it's a very stressful one and sometimes it can get, uh, it can in fact you, affect you mentally and, 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 and you know uh, in a very spiritual way as well. And sometimes having a co-founder 
allows you to at least bounce ideas uh, against against that that person uh, for you to get some validation as well. And you know, like the saying goes, right? Um, uh, you can definitely do more with with multiple you know stronger minds put, being put together. Um, but what comes with that at times is also conflict, right? Um, all of us are human beings and not, none of us are perfect. Uh, there are situations where you're going to be dealing with challenges with, with yeah. founders. Uh, and that has happened to me as well. I, I think the key thing is as long as you're able to find a middle ground, and it's super important, and I'll stress this again, uh, um, it's super important to have that very frank and candid conversation from the early early days. And I think, you know, Juhok, you said it nicely where you you even encourage founders to have a sort of a departure, pre a, a pre-nuptial agreement in a way, right, from a, a, from a founding team perspective. Um, I think that's super key. Um, I, I think it's very important to, to, uh, to, to really go deep, not, not just talk about the business, but talk about what matters to you most? Is it money? Is it uh, uh, fame? Is it exposure? Is uh, a combination of things. And I think as, as founders get together, it's super important to have that very candid conversation and figure out what's important to them. Okay, interesting. Uh, Joseph, what about uh, your perspective? Yeah, I also define, define, define co-founders, right? Because um, you could be a single single founder with very early employees. And then these people are seen as uh, uh, people that have uh, started a company with you. And basically, I mean, if you share openly with um, any of your employees or any of your team members, they can be viewed as uh, co-founders because they started out right, right on onset with you. They're not any different. Right? So, now, but it, so then I guess that the question is, is it important for you to open up? Is it important for you to share? Is it important for you to take in comments and trust? I think it's absolutely important. Like when, uh, when uh, Pactor merged with uh, 17 to form F17, and I was put into a team, uh, I took over the 17 team, right? There were 39 people in there. And uh, while, while these people were not uh, 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 co-founders per se, and, uh, but I treat the 39 people like family, and uh, these are the people who started the journey from scratch. And so are they all co-founders? Yeah, for sure, they're all co-founders because they, they were all there from day one. And, uh, very candidly and openly, we, we, we talked about the problems that we were facing and we went, we went in there as one. So I would say absolutely important, I, I think. Uh, but, you know, the definition of co-founder per se it may not be as, as strict a, a definition as, as one would, would have it. Well, what about, uh, what about uh, you know, uh, obviously, you know, I, would, I have seen some of these situations, you know, in cases where somehow, you know, you get a co-founder and, and along the way, you find that the co-founder may not be pulling, pulling his or her weight or has become even maybe, you know, uh, this illusion, you know, uh, be a disruptive to the organization. So, so what do you do, you know, in such cases? Um, you want uh, to yeah, maybe I'll go first. Um, I think it's on mute. No, no, I, I, think, um, I, I think, um, you know, I think back to the point about uh, being super candid, right? Um, when you sort of have established that, that uh, before starting a company, you establish that relationship with that co-founder. Um, I think it's super important as well to always check, check in, you know, to really discuss you know, where things are at different milestones, at different situations, good and bad, right? You should celebrate the good things together and you should also discuss the, the not so good things together. I think when it comes to a situation where a co-founder is not pulling their weight or things are just not working out, um, you know, don't don't delay that conversation. I think it's super important to really just bring it up, regardless of how um, uh, you know, uncomfortable it is, right? To discuss that, um, and to be quite honest, it's not just the co-founder team. I think I think Joseph is right, right? I, the, the two of my last my last two startups, you know, I don't have a co-founder, but I have a co-founding team, right? A set of lieutenants, I call them, right? That always uh, is my go-to guys that, that will help, you know, build this, this business together. Without them, there's, there's no business. Um, and I think it's super important, and not just a, a sole co-founder or a set of co-founding team, it's super important to have those conversations uh, throughout the life of, of the business and have very frequent check-ins. Uh, and, have, have, uh, and, 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 you know, basically it's a two-way conversation. It's not just about them. It's also about you as, as a CEO, as a leader. If there are things that you can improve, things that you should change, you should definitely have those conversations as well. So it's still 
Yeah, communication is very important. Well, communication, I think, is key, right? Uh, because again, I think if you think about it, right, the biggest asset to your to your company, whatever you do, right, is people, right? This this is going to be sort of uh, something that you want to make sure that you you maintain, you sustain, and you keep evolving. You know, things will always change. When you go through bad times, things things are the chemistry is going to be to be a bit a bit more interesting. Uh, you know, you you got to react to it and and hopefully plan for things. But to be quite honest, sometimes you cannot plan for everything, right? sure. and you just have to be quite ready in terms of dealing with the not so fun situations. I, let, me, let me add to that. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give uh, my perspective. Uh, now, healthy conflict is always good, and it's okay to disagree between co-founders as long as it leads to brainstorming and sharing of ideas. But uh, one thing, one reason uh, you really want to get a strong board and very respected board members is in a situation like this. So when you have a difficult situation where the conflict between co-founders uh, gets so bad that they cannot work together, uh, you need to look up to your board and have your board resolve it. And typically it's a senior member on the board, somebody who's respected by the investors and also respected by the founders who needs to step in here and try and resolve this amicably. And uh, hopefully it gets resolved amicably. If it doesn't, then a, a hard decision may have to be taken. But uh, the advice I would give all founders is try and get an independent member on your board as early as possible, uh, because this person will be uh, able to bring uh, a different perspective and not necessarily be aligned to either the investors or to the founders. Yeah, I actually fully agree with Ben because, uh, in, and we have seen a few cases of this uh, where you know the fallout between the founders, and you know you end up. Uh, I think the the board member or the, the significant investor where both of them you know trust. The, the particular board member will usually end up having to step in to, to mediate and find a solution, right? It could be a very, very drastic situation, you know, uh, but whatever it is, I think it's, it's uh, what Ben said is very true. Okay, great. Uh, maybe let me move forward to the next thing about uh, finding and retaining uh, talent. Uh, T, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, when you are starting out, and even to the extent that uh, when the company is already growing and spending, uh, you cannot afford the market salary. You still cannot afford the market salaries. You know, uh, compensations like you know what Facebook is pay paying, uh, Google is paying, and probably even now Grab is paying. Right? You know, they're going to track all those talent. Now, all startups face this issue. How do you then attract good talent to join you, despite you know not being able to pay them the competitive market? Conversation and I think I believe all startups face this issue. You know, yeah, absolutely. Because you know, uh, especially early stage startups, right? That's when things are most difficult. Um, look, you know, there's no sort of magic answer to this, right? They are the the usual things you can kind of look at when you look at uh, giving a, a much more fairer. Uh, chunk of the stock options, right? That you can kind of give to some of the early guys that kind of come in. Um, but but to be quite honest, you know, sometimes you don't want to basically make um, financial gain as the most important factor, right? When you want to join a startup, I think what I look for essentially are people with a lot of heart and passion. And 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 the reality of it is, you're not going to be able to always find. Uh, the people that, 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 that is super ideal for you, right? You need to find someone that basically is the best fit at that point in time for you, for, for that company itself. Um, because there, are, there will be talents out there who, who may not be looking for the grind of a startup, but just wants to be a part of something that hopefully makes the same amount of money if he works for Facebook or any of those companies you mentioned. But they, they just want to have the taste of, of a startup. There, there are those other talents, which I prefer, who are looking for joining something which is much bigger than themselves, right? They want to change the world. They want to disrupt certain things. They, they believe in the vision and, 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 and you know, and, and what you're trying to achieve. I, I think that that is what you need to keep on looking for. You can always offer the different varieties of packages or things as creative to make it more financially viable for them. But at the end of the day, it takes two to tango. You need to find someone who believes in you as well, who believes in the company, what they're trying to achieve. Very fair, yeah, fair, fair comment from you. Uh, maybe let me uh, have another question. We talk about ESOP, right? Yeah. Uh, and perhaps I can direct this to Joseph and Ben. Ben, you know, you've seen so many companies, right? Now, uh, my question, I frame it this way, right? My, many employees, especially those who are not in a senior position, may not necessarily see value in, in ESOP. 
Now, what they want is cash now, especially in this market situation where companies are making salary cuts, right? And yet cash is very important to you. you know, what do you do in this kind of situation? Perhaps uh, maybe Joseph, you know, you want to start? Yeah. Um, well, there, I mean, again, I think uh, there, <laughs> there, is, there, is no, there is no right or wrong answer to this. Uh, every situation is different. Every team member is different. And uh, there is, uh, you can't say, I'm going to give you more cash um, now. And, and because maybe this team member doesn't really care so much about cash, they would care more about stocks. And, and on, on the other side, the team member may cash, uh, care more about uh, cash than, than stock. Now, as a, as, a, as a founder, I think it, it's more important uh, that you find, you find your internal balance. What are you, uh, what are you, what are you willing to give? Right? What are you willing to give and accept if you cannot keep somebody? You cannot win every employee. But people will get coached. Today you pay $200,000 a year. You think it's a lot. Somebody else comes in with $300,000 a year. You, you never win this game, right? Set your bar as to how much you're willing to pay in terms of cash and stock. And then if you're able to keep the employee, great. If you're not able to keep the employee, fine. But now in the case where, where team members sacrifice for you, now, it's very important that you remember these sacrifices and then you make good on these sacrifices in the future so that in the next time that you're in trouble again, uh, people are willing to take that sacrifice because they see you're going to be fair to them in the future. And so I think first, so, so, so the, the, the short answer to that, that question is uh, basically find your internal balance as to what you're willing to give. Uh, but when people take the hit for you, don't forget about uh, returning the hit in the future. Yep. Okay. Ben, do you have any comments? Yeah, on this? yeah I'll just add some, a couple of things to that. I think... Uh, first of all, if, if there are employees that you're looking, people you're looking to hire that are more the, interested in, in a high compensation, then they may not be the right fit at this point in time. Maybe they're in a stage in their life where they really need the high salary um, and instead of ESOPs, and they don't have that ability to, to, uh, to wait a few years until the ESOPs get monetized. Probably this is not the right time for them, and they will quite possibly leave after a year. Uh, so I would say incentivize all your employees with ESOPs. Now, there will be opportunities along the way uh, as you raise subsequent funding rounds, particularly if your valuation is going up, where investors will give a little bit of liquidity to employees or even the founders. Not a lot, but some liquidity so that they can see some, uh, some monetization of their stake. So uh, I would not uh, get into a situation where you're compensating one employee a lot more than everybody else because people find out and that leads to, uh, leads to unnecessarily resentment. Yeah, that becomes a circular loop, you know, you never, never end, never stop, right? Yeah, yeah. I quite fully agree. Uh, let me jump on to the next topic. I know that uh, I'm wary of the, of, of the time left, you know, uh, uh, the topic about raising capital investors. T and Joseph, this is very specific to you. Uh, how important is it to look for right investors? Or should start up just take whatever money there is? And, and, and also very important, you know, what are the things to look for investors? And maybe you can share you know, if you have some experience uh, about having really the right investors and not so right investors, maybe you can start with T first. Okay, all right. I, I think it's super critical. I think money is money. There's always ways to find money, to be quite honest with you. If you're creative enough, you're able to raise uh, money from, from just various, various sources that you can able to find. I think the right investor is definitely the key thing. But to me, a right investor is someone who, you know, a company who, who, who digs deep with you, right? To really understand um, your business and, and, and really find ways to just add value. Um, you know, if you're, if you're looking for a, a investors uh, that can add value by introducing you to a, a portfolio companies that will actually add value to what you're trying to achieve, that's, that's an amazing thing that uh, an investor can bring in. Um, and, and I think, you know, in, in one or two hawk slide, right, um, you know, one of the important things for founders to, to really remember is to always listen and, and to be open to different ideas and different opinions. Um, and as a founder myself, you know, I, I, I've gone through that. Uh, younger days, yes, it's um, a little bit more stubborn. I feel like I, I, I can rule the world. I, I'm like what the classic millennial is today, right? In terms of, I, I think I know everything. Uh, but as, as I get a little wiser and older, I think, um, you know, you do cherish and you do appreciate the different perspectives that people give you, especially your investors. But it's also important that um, as a leader, as a founder, um, you listen to all options, but you make the decisions. 
you know, you, you, you take the responsibility of the decision that you make as well. Um, the, the not so right investors, I've been quite lucky. I haven't had too many encounters with not so right investors, but I, I speak to enough founders in terms of the horror stories that we, that we hear. But one thing um, that I have experienced to myself as I evaluate different investors, there are certain investors out there, you know, who fail to balance out investment thesis and a founder's vision, right? Um, one of them could be a, a very short-sighted investor that, that basically want to maximize as much as they can based on the thesis that they have, how much ownership they're going to get, and, and all the, the types of, different types of clauses that they put into the, the agreement. Um, and, and really leaving it a very small room for the founders and the, and the team to really be able to expand beyond that first round of funding or the initial round of funding. Um, I think restrictive stipulations and, and ones that may potentially impact the ability uh, to, to raise more funding or to, or to look at different exit options is something that I think uh, you, you, as a founder, you, you try to avoid looking at those investors. Uh, but like I said, I think I've been quite lucky. I've been, uh, I've been, been really been blessed with, with working with, with founder, uh, investors that are, are, are very close in terms of relationship wise. And I think see eye to eye in terms of the many things that we're trying to do. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Joseph, do you have any you know, perspective on this? Yeah, so I, I, I think our we we got lucky, right? So in, in during during the first the first institutional capital that we took in, we had a choice that we, we picked, and uh, based on our gut, we picked the right right investor. And uh, along the along the way, all we, we we brought on I mean quite a long cap table of, of investors. And um, generally, our, our, in in the last seven years, my my view has been you take money where you get money, you just take it. Uh, you, 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 don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't question too much, and especially when you're trying to scale, you don't have time to cherry pick. And, and um, I mean, Southeast Asia was not like, the best market to raise, uh, raise capital at. I mean, we've, in, in the last seven years, we've raised close to a sizable amount of money that is not from Southeast Asia, but from Northeast Asia. Uh, but it's not been easy. Now, but, you know, while we got lucky along the seven years, there, there are times that we didn't get so lucky. And... Uh, there were some uh, some some situations where, where it got sticky and, and and you know that that's where I develop a view now, right? Um, getting too much money may not be the best thing, and uh, it's better for you to pick uh, the right investor and then find a way to deal with not having so much money. Um, of course, it's easy to say now that we've raised all this money, but <laughs> if, if, yeah. if, if you're taking a step back, you know, instead of raising hundred dollars, if I raised forty dollars, could I have made done with? Uh, could I could I have done with the forty? Could I have done as well as with the forty dollars? Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe we wouldn't have wasted an extra X amount of dollars, dollars just because we had it. So I would say, I would say now definitely very, very, very important. Right? When you have no way out, you always have a way out, right? Find a way out and, uh, and just delay until you find the right person. You always have a way out. Okay, that's, that's good. Yeah, I think uh, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, maybe a couple of last questions uh, to, to, to you guys. Um, uh, one is... Um, what is, perhaps, you know, maybe phrase it this way, what is one important mistake you make in your startups which on hindsight you maybe could have uh, avoided? And if you had to start all over again, what would you have done? Uh, T. Um, uh, one of my startups, I think I have, uh, one, well, not I think I know, uh, that I recruited the wrong co-founder. And uh, what, uh, against your... Uh, what you suggested just now, there was no prenuptial agreement, which was very difficult to 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 sort of resolve. Um, but um, but look, I, I think you learn a lot from that. Um, you know, I think you go back to the basics, where sometimes it's not about finding a um, a one or two particular strong co-founders. I'm really a big believer right now, where it is about a co-founding team. Um, I, I mentioned this. I think my last two startups, I have. Uh, uh, a group of folks that I go to, and, 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 and thankfully they believe in me as well. I think I hope they do. Um, <laughs> and, and we and, and we're out to go solve problems and and, and, and do creating things together. Uh, I I think like what Joseph said, right? And, and when these guys take the hit for you, uh, you make sure that you you do double and triple uh, favors back to them uh, when the time comes, right? when the opportunity arises. Uh, and I, I think I've done decently well with regards to making sure that these guys are also able to monetize some of the things in the past few startups that I've done. Uh, we can do better for sure, uh, but that's maybe for future opportunities. Okay. Uh, Joseph, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? 
Yeah, uh, it goes back to actually the same, the same answer I had previously, right? Uh, uh, raise less money, raise what you need, uh, but raise enough. Because the more you raise, uh, the more you spend. Um, and you might, you might not need to give away that much equity at the end of the day. Of course, it's easy to say now that it's done, but, um, but you may not need that much. And, uh, a lot of times when you have more, you spend more and you, may, you, you lose equity. Like uh, there, there, is, there is a question in here that says, how much, how much equity do you think a CEO needs to have when you first start a company? Everything. Keep everything. Why would you not keep 100% of the company when you, when you, when you start the company? That is the, most, that is the most precious thing. Now I look at uh, now I look, expensive thing. <laughs> uh, look back today and I'm like, oh man. Uh, <laughs> you probably have no choice, right? You know, when you started, right? You know, <laughs> what I would give. Uh, <laughs> okay. Good, good, interesting perspective. All right, no, I, I think we. We, we run running short of time, but let me open up the, the panel for Q&A from the audience. Uh, just a minute. Uh, wow, I see there are so many questions. Sorry, I think we, we would uh, um, pick and choose now. Yeah, okay. Well, okay, there are some I mean matters where the slides will be low. Okay, this is How would you assess the potential of the founder within the first 30 minutes, considering there are so many traits to be a successful founder? A founder. I guess maybe this is directed to the Ben first. Yeah, a um, couple of traits I look uh, look for, and uh, it's a good question because it is it is not easy to assess somebody in thirty minutes. Uh, we typically look for a combination of uh, confidence and humility. Confidence, you've got to be sure of what you're doing, but also humility to take feedback. Uh, secondly, uh, we try to assess: is the founder really looking long term here versus looking for a quick flip? Uh, this is a five to seven year journey. You should be getting into this, uh, expecting to take this all the way to the IPO. Now, if you can sell it earlier, that's great. So we, we look to assess that. And then the third thing is, uh, is there really a personal connect? Is this a founder that I as an investor believe I can work with? And uh, I think the founder should be thinking the same thing about the investor. Uh, not easy to make that assessment in 30 minutes. Uh, typically have it over several meetings, but uh, these are the sort of the traits we look for. Mm -hmm. Uh, T and Joseph, do you have any, any uh, thoughts on that? No. No. So I guess the uh, next question is uh, uh, think, uh, Okay, so, so to, to the two founders, right? What is the biggest fear in startups and how do you overcome them? Oh, there's so many fears. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe talk about one, two, three, you know. There, there's so many things that keeps you awake at night. Um, look, I, I think, you know, uh, first and foremost, is that I think as a founder, is you, you need to make sure that you believe in yourself and you believe in the company that you're trying to do. Uh, I've come across many founders, especially ones that are coming from sort of a, a professional career and they're looking at dabbling into startups for the first time. The one thing that I hate the most is, uh, I use that word wisely, is, is because I, I do see these founders who are putting one foot on, on, a, on two, you know, two foot of two different boots. Mm -hmm. They like to, to, to take that cushy salary from the current job that they have, but they also want to sort of start looking and brewing that new startup that they have. Uh, you know, the key question I always have for them is if you don't believe in yourself and coming out and do this fully, why would you, you know, how, how do you get uh, investors, uh, employees and partners and potential, uh, you know, investors to, to believe in you? Um, I think the biggest fear, back to that question, I guess, is, is you, 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 you're giving this all out, right? You're, you're making sure that you go big or you go home. And, and uh, even though with all that confidence that you have and, and you, you're always a little bit paranoid uh, in terms of what, what could go wrong, right? And, but it, it is important to, to realize that, it's important to embrace that, but I guess it's also important to really figure out, um, you know, uh, how do you keep moving and how do you keep building and how do you keep uh, improving your, yourself as, as an entrepreneur, as a company, and everything you do. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's interesting, you yeah, know, interesting perspective. Um, actually, I thought I just one, is, uh, I wanted to, oh, um, the question is, you know, I, I, interesting question. How important is the value of first mover advantage? 
I know you have a different perspective. <laughs> now, uh, maybe we can start with you, Joseph first. Okay. Um, it depends. It really depends. I might sometimes, uh, in my experience, not so. I mean, uh, not so important if you're able to out-execute the person. Right? Uh, because being first there means you spend more. Right? And, they, and if you're not as creative, you don't have a, as deep pockets, then maybe it's not that important. Get somebody else to figure it out first. Right? And, and that's what we did with live streaming. The Chinese uh, live streaming players figured it all out. And then we basically took the same model, adapted it for the local market. And uh, we were last in the game. There were eight players out there and uh, we were ranked eight. And all I told my team was, you know, we, are, we just got to be that 1% uh, better at executing. We'll, we'll eventually catch up when we did. We, it took us eight months to catch up in, in Taiwan and then in Japan, the same thing as well. So I, I don't think it's that important, but the execution, not being the first person there, the execution is extremely important. You need to be so much faster um, to catch up. I would add that uh, Facebook yeah. is not the first social media company and Google was not the first search engine. Yeah. So they still they still became the winners. I know. I think, I think that's enough said. I think I, I'm, a, I'm not a believer in a, a first move first advantage. I guess it really depends on the industry you're going into. But at least for the last few startups that I did, I mean, look, the last startup that I did, Spacebot, we were the 43rd player, 43rd, yeah, uh, in terms of co-working space operator in in, uh, in, in Singapore, Southeast Asia, I can't remember now. Um, uh, you know, at times it, it, it's all about execution. It's all about, uh, you know, knowing exactly what you're going after and, and, and do a really good job on it. Um, it's not how you start, it's really how you finish. Great. I think my, my colleague uh, jumping up and down and telling me that, you know, you know we're almost time there now. Uh, okay. Uh, there are some questions about uh, whether the slides are going to be available. Uh, my colleagues have said that. Uh, Slides can be seen in the recording of them, just reading out what she wrote to me, of the session, which will be available upon request and to verify attendees. So please email to us. Um, I'm sorry, we do run out of time. Uh, we come to the end of the session. Um, now, um, hold, hold on. Before we go, um, I'd like to just like to Tell you, remind you about the second session next week on Friday, uh, same time. The topic is raising capital. Uh, my colleague James from the Growth Fund will be your host. Uh, and we do have another two awesome founders on the panel, uh, Cindy from Sunday, the leading insure tech company in Thailand, and Nick from Validus, the leading SME financing company in Southeast Asia. This will be a very exciting session and all of both of the families will be sharing with them with you all the experiences in you know raising capital and which will be much more detailed than, than what I covered uh, just now. So go and register for this event. Uh, you can use the link uh, on the right hand side uh, or, or scan the QR code. Now if you do have feedback or want to hear uh, more better stories, you can uh, uh, or just want to chat, you can contact me directly or direct them to Vertex Holding link. Uh, you can also view the program for the next 11, for all the total 11 sessions on this link, uh, which is the second link, right? Uh, and you will be able to register also for all or any other session in this program too. Now, before we lock out, please fill in the survey which will appear once you click leave the the seminar, uh, the webinar session. And finally, I just really want to say a big thank you to you, all my three awesome panel members, and to all of you in the audience for taking time to join us today. You all have a good day and a great weekend. Be safe, healthy, and for all Singaporeans, happy National Day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.